there are three key data set in this. In there are three key data set in fraction paper. Evolutionary distance, uh, protein interaction, and finish. Yeah. So basically, uh, so we need to load the three data sets into R. Then, uh, so first, second, we need to do some informatics to merge the three data sets. I'm going to explain uh, what the informatics means. Okay, so the first one, uh, data we load into, uh, oh, I forgot to set my path, uh, set my path to a source file, it should work. So on Windows, um, it apparently you can read the R file directly from the zip file, and then you won't be able to continue because the zip file is the archive, and even if you try to set, set to the working directory, it going to goes to the zip directory and won't be able to find the data. So you have to make sure on Windows everything is extracted to a folder. So in a in a zip archive it, it's not going to work. Uh, <coughs> so I run this. There, yeah, so the data on on my right hand, uh, upper right, I can now see data. That's the evolutionary distance data. So KA, KS, and Omega. Uh, Okay, Google K A K S. What do you find? Yeah, Google K A K S. You probably want to also add say Wikipedia. Just make sure it goes there. K A K S Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Uh, let me let me also Google. Uh, make sure. Well, I think it's uh, okay. You see it. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> KKS Wikipedia. Is it Yeah. See, now the first one in my case is this one. It, it's diff Is it different on yours? I'm not sure. I had to go back and research it. Oh. I had to put in KA. Yeah, the first one is, yeah, that's what it is. Okay, now read it uh, and see whether we can figure this one out. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's some uh, art studio. So if you want to see it, you can have it. Yeah, if you can, you, you can, in, in you can, you can have it. Okay. 
Okay, everyone, that, that's Jessica. Do you agree with Jessica? Can you say that again? Well, um, <coughs> non synonymous substitutions are variants at the nucleotide level that result in variants at the amino acid level. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, people say you are not speaking English. <laughs> uh, there's a change in like a mutation of a nucleotide that causes a different amino you know, acid to be produced. Uh, uh, is that making sense? Yeah, it is. <coughs> yeah, that's what I have to do. So, K-A, uh, A for... What is A for non synonymous? Why is it called A? I, I don't know. A probably for uh, amino acid, probably. Basically, chain that amino acid is A, K A. S is for synonymous, probably, yeah. So S means change uh, uh, mutation at the DNA level, but show no effect at the protein level. So, so why people calculate the ratio of Ka over Ks, that's also called omega. So this Greek, yeah. this Greek letter, letter, this omega basically is Ka versus Ks is also called omega. Why, why people calculate this ratio? Recently, there is a nuclear disaster in Japan, and uh, 
and people who, who really stay for working that station, they must have a lot of mutation incurred by the nuclear radiation. And many of them probably have a high risk of dying cancer in the next few years, at least uh, in the next decade or probably even in a few years. What so, about like single cell? Is that a negative selection? Not about company. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 well, basically, the, um, this is an example of negative selection because change, change is going to cause cancer or tumor. Why, why this one is a negative selection? It's detrimental, yeah. Oh. Actually, that's a good point. The positive selection will increase the fitness, and negative selection will decrease. Uh, that's actually not the okay. case. Uh, uh, it's more subtle than that. Uh, so, uh, positive selection usually means a mutation leads to a gain of fitness. So, you, you gain an advantage by making that mutation. And negative selection means uh, mutation often leads to a decrease in fitness. So it's become a detrimental to an individual. So, so which one do we think is more frequent? <coughs> Why positive selection is more frequent? <laughs> well, yeah, you, 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 I might be curious. And basically, do you think most of do most of my mutation will have positive or negative effect on your um, individual fitness? Do 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 you like to have to have more mutations? I would like to have more positive. But to, to most of um, most of mutations you have negative or positive effect. Well, negative, not most positive. If it's mutation is tend to be more positive, wouldn't you like to be radiated by nuclear? No, I mean, <laughs> they're more negative, but they're not most not most positive mutations. I guess happen over a period of time. So like if you have a negative, or if you have a mutation, it's usually negative. I guess most, like what I'm trying to say is like most positive changes in the, in the gene, like, that is a question, kind of, if you're having a positive change, because doesn't that go into life, like, survival and things like that. So if you have like a mutation, and it's a mutation, then it's probably going to be negative, right? Why? Why? But that's actually correct. Most of mutations are negative. A negative um, effect on the individual. I guess because um, if you have a change in the sequence, then that in turn changes everything else. Like what proteins are produced and you know, like what function that they create and things like that. So, so, so now, it's, now we, we, we are really getting. So usually, a pro, uh, protein and gene are fairly complicated. complicated. They have hundreds of amino acids. They, they, they have many of them. They have different charts, different uh, 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 protein, like a nucleic and a polyphenolic, very sophisticated structure for protein to perform a function. So most of the chains will will disturb the protein, intervene the protein to perform some function. If you think about I mean, uh, 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 a chain that's a random, random chain to a, uh, say, a laptop, if you randomly change something, it's probably going to make a laptop less function. If you just randomly make changes. <laughs> you have to be, if you want to, it has to be really rare uh, event if you randomly make change to your computer, it actually improves performance. You have to really know how to do it. Right. So, but it's actually odd. Uh, so, so basically, there will be 
there will be say tons of random mutations and then among them there's they are one of the few changes that can improve basically by chance that can improve the okay. so 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 the the so the KA basically measure the positive selection, uh, oh, the ratio, so we have the, so basically we have KA over KS, this ratio. Uh, uh, no, uh, that's a, that's a wrong way. I'm basically say that, can you say it, sorry. So, uh, the ratio, this ratio can be either greater than 1, equal to 1, or less to 1. So this ratio is always positive because this, the number of this ratio is always greater than 0 because there are number of changes. So, but it, so basically I'm saying which one is, uh, which one is positive selection? And um, this is probably a multiple choice. Uh, positive, negative, selection, and a neutral. And this is you say which one is which. Uh, this one is neutral. Some other genes uh, at a chromosome level which are more less prone to mutation, it will have less than K, a smaller KS. So we, we we normalize the chain of amino acid by the mutation background, and then we use this ratio to estimate the overall uh, uh, selection level for every gene. It's almost like a. Uh, it, it, uh, What's uh, if you look at the uh, say how uh, how much improvement uh, say you let's say you you go to a, 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 a you want to prepare yourself for a sports competition you initially you have an initial performance after you training and you say how, how much have I have been improving my performance after I spent a month of intense training. And then you want to see whether you want to continue with that paradigm, training paradigm or not. So you, you compare with your current performance with your previous performance. You don't compare the absolute value. Right? So of course, people, the, 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 
the world record holder going to always run much faster than most of us. But if that a paradigm actually work for him, he should improve his perform average performance. Right? It's really that the, the, the relative change. So basically here we, we are comparing the relative change of every gene, the amino acid level and the mutation level. Some of the genes going to have a high mutation rate, some of them can just a lower mutation rate. So this ratio basically is the indication of the strength of natural selection. Because most of the genes perform a very sophisticated function, and so change of the change of them often uh, uh, will uh, affect how the molecule protein perform the function. So most of the mutation going to be less than one. Uh, most most of the gene going to have an omega less than one. Yeah, uh, in only a very rare occasions. You see omega greater than one. Yeah, most of the selection is like. What, if you think about how can how is it possible there can be more change at the, the protein level, but than DNA level? That is because even though there will be change at a, a DNA level, it is only those who will pass on to the next generation will be selected at DNA level. So even though mutation occur at DNA level uh, at, at a constant rate for say say if there are two genes, gene A or gene B, let's say there are two genes, gene A and gene B, they all have the same KS. Okay. So they all going to have the same KS. But gene A, the change of uh, gene A tend to be uh, is selective. So it, this one will be more likely to pass on to the uh, progeny. Right. This one change that the gene B is less likely to be passed on. So so over time the ch the change at the next level, this KA in gene A will will accumulate a lot. But this one will not. The KS this one will accumulate a lot. This one going to stay very relatively low. So over time, this one can quick, can, especially when they are positive selection here, the advantage one will quickly sweep through the population. And this one can become very large. That's because the, the positive selection will accumulate in the project. That's, this is, this is a, something called the fixation. So only those change at the uh, so there will be random change uh, to many DMR, but only those fixed in the population pass on to the next generation uh, will be fixed in the population. It is because of this fixation, and you will see that's why the amino acid chain can be higher than the, 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 the mutation, the background mutation. Okay, so even so, just reading this data, we have actually spent almost 40 minutes on this. And the next one we read in the protein traction data. That uh, one I call it a pairs. Uh, the pairs is basically pairs of a gene names, which I call ORF1 and ORF2. ORF means uh, open reading frame. Open reading frame. Basically, uh, this is a term used when people try to find out the genes in the genome. So how do we find the genes? You basically find where the start code down, where the stop code down, and where the promoter, where is the ribosome termination. So there will be a lot of features for, it's actually a quite a sophisticated work to predict a gene. But once we predict since we, we don't know whether they're the protein or not, we just call it an open reading frame. So that's what the, the term comes from. So if you look at that, this, this name, it has something like a Y, and it has the, always start with like a Y for East. And then it start with a P, L, G, R, H, R, 
my uh, my guess is the the middle letter is about chromosome and L and R means the left and the right arm uh, with the centromere. Centromere is the in the middle. Uh, left means on the left arm. R means on the right arm. Which one are you reading from? What? Which one are you reading from? Yeah, uh, anyway. Everything starts with a Y, uh -huh. and then the third letter is L or R, left or right. Uh -huh. And in the middle, that's a chromosome. And the last letter you see is, is either C or W. What do you think C and W stands for? Wow. Well, I was going to say wild type or um, the That's a good guess. Yes. Except <laughs> every gene in the genome is a wild type gene. Oh. Only mutation causes it and causes it. So every gene there is supposed to be a wild type gene. Oh, okay. It's a gene name, right? Mm -hmm. you have, you, both mutant and wild type gene are going to be called the same name. Mm -hmm. It's just different shapes there. Yeah. Okay. The W and the C actually is is the first letter of some two very famous people, biologists. What's the trick? Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, because they are not the two person proposed the DNA structure. Yeah. And why, why we have to name something called Watson and Crick for gene? What, what's the purpose of that? If you, now, first, uh, to, in order for you to appreciate that, you have to think about the, the DNA structure. So, so what's, the, what's the structure of the DNA? Yes, it's double helix. So it is basically, uh, oh, how do I draw a double helix? Uh, uh, something like this. Uh, right, That's beautiful. There's a five prime, three prime, and five prime, three prime. So what what this means that the, if if there's a gene here, if there's a gene on this strand, it's going to be if if we draw this uh, uh, linearly, if we draw the DNA sequence like this. Uh, five prime, three prime, three prime, five prime. If there's a gene coded in this direction, it will be reading this way. If another gene coded in the opposite direction, it will be coded uh, this way. Right. So in this, in, in, in this way, it will be ATG. This way is also ATG. But when you read it, uh, the complementary stream on the opposite direction, this way should be C, right? This should be A, this should be T. So, so basically, there's a, every gene will exist on the, on the DNA highway, but it can be, if you picture the DNA in the road, it can be either on the one side or on the opposite side. And we have to give a direction to, like, like if you give an address to a, to a, to a house on the street, we often say an odd number on one side, even number on the other side. And for the gene name, uh, instead of giving an odd number, even number, we actually call it W or C. But I, I forgot which one is W, which one is C. But basically, that's the reason. If it's on um, one, one strand we call it W, the other one we call it C. So basically by looking at this name, you can pretty much tell something about that gene. So first one is E, second one is chromosome, L and R means left or right, and then there's a number. Now the number is basically almost like a street number. You can tell relatively where that gene is on the chromosome. And then with, the, with which side of the uh, DNA double helix is on there. So there. So, but, uh, but here we have the pairs of genes.
Why we put pairs of genes? Because uh, all this gene, each pair means there's a physical interaction between them. Literally means there's the ex the experimental evidence that two genes interact with each other. So, uh, if, if, I, if I, just for simplicity, I'm going to call this one gene 1. This one gene 2, gene 3. Uh, I'm going to call this one gene 3 again and gene 5. Gene 3, gene 6. And uh, gene 4 again and gene 7. So if I do this, so then this is a pair. I'm going to convert this into a network. So basically, I have gene 1 interact with gene 2. Uh, I'm going to also put say gene 1, gene 3. Uh, that's the first one. Then I say 3 and 4 also interact. 3 and 5, 3 and 6, 4 and 7, 1 and 3. But basically, that's how I draw the, the natural. So, so I'm here. So every, everything here is a pair, right? but then I can, based on the pair, I can draw the network. I mean, this is actually the key. So how we, now the, there is one catch here. There's no, no self-interaction, no self-interaction. If, if I allow gene one interact with gene one, I basically say, but we don't consider the self-interaction. So, so, so when we compare the pairwise interaction here, we do not allow this. There's no self-interaction. This is basically the, the protein interaction network. Based on, based on the pairwise, we, we basically have this. They are, the, they are just presented in different format. So now the I guess uh, if we look at the structure of the pairs, this is this is the what the quiz cover. So if we look at the structure right now, by default, it's read uh, it's read as a, a fake number factor, which is basically a fake number. And that can be a problem because uh, we we are interested in gene name. We are not interested in that number. That fake number. Sorry, what? I didn't understand what you just said. Oh, uh, because if we want to match each gene differently, <coughs> we want to match by name, not by the assigned fake number. That number could be assigned. Different gene can be assigned the same number. You see the. Are assigned. Oh, okay. yeah, it's assigned and based on something we cannot control. So we don't want that to happen. <coughs> yeah. In fact, you can actually tell the for the first gene name there are three three twenty fake numbers. For the second one there are three one five seven fake numbers. So obviously they are not assigned the same number. Yeah. So uh, we want every gene be every Every gene with exactly the same name treated the same gene. So that's basically the part of the uh, uh, problem of R. So we want to make sure gene names are treated as the letters, not numbers, not fake numbers. Uh, yeah, fake number basically means factor. Yeah. So and in R, there's something called S dot character. And that will convert all the gene name back into a, a letter. So once we do that, uh, we we can we can run the structure pairs again. There it now is something called CHR, which for character. Uh, so now it's a 
in uh, in character. So we that's what we want. Uh, and we do the same thing also for the data for the evolutionary data. In the evolutionary data, uh, that ORF name is also a fake number, and we change that one also to the gene name to the letters. Okay, and and then we also read the growth finish <coughs> data. And that's a data called fit. That's something called this growth fitness dot home dot csv. Yes, yeah, so what's that? What data is contained in the file? Aha, here. Uh, so so the first uh, column is something called gene. That's uh, basically the regular name for the gene. And then when we scroll to the right, you see something called ORF. Uh, that's the open reading frame. Uh, and then there is many technical information how this growth finish is measured. The number of probes, measurement, F status, log P, and we can uh, skip all of that. We're basically looking at this, this column, YPD, uh, YPDGE, YPG, YPE, YPL and YP.1, DMP, those things. So what those things are, so how do we measure the fitness data? So so how, how do we know the fitness contribution for every gene to the yeast? So so this is the systematic gene name. YPD is its fitness. Right now it's called point nine five. I'm going to point nine six. How do we know what this means? This is means a deletion mutant. It's basically a homologous deletion mutant also. Homologous deletion mutant. The easy the diploid as we are also diploid. So basically, this gene is deleted, and it's in different background. And then, what we measure is measure uh, competitive growth fitness. Competitive growth. Basically, measure growth rate between double mutant and and wild type is so the wild type is always 1.0 yeah we are, we always assume wild type is 100 percent fit yeah. but for the mutant how do we calculate the mutant we basically have a have a large uh, glass wire we put the wild type e cell there we also put the mutants there so we let it grow, say, for 20 hours or 10 hours. And then at the end of it, we measure how many are wild type, how many are mutant. Let's say the wild type has a number. And, and then how do we measure the fitness of this one? We know the wild type is 100%. Yeah. Could you go back a little bit? I got lost. Well. OK. Uh, so in the vial, you have your mutant and your wild type. Yes. You let them grow. For, say, one day. Okay. And after that? We measure the, the, the number of every cell. Wild type of cell and mutant cell. How do you do your measurement? Because it has a barcode. Because every cell has a barcode. We, we basically give a social security number for every strain. For every gene. We, we know that we have sequenced every gene in the each genome, right? And we also put a unique 
bar code. We put bar code for IVG. So for this deletion mutant, we give it a bar code, give it a social security number, a serial number. So you sequence within that vial? No, we use a probe to do a hybridization. This is the DNA chip hybridization. Okay. Yeah, we, we can actually hybridize. In fact, we didn't just put one mutant, we actually put hundreds of other mutants. Okay. In fact, we, we can't even put the entire library there. Okay. So, so every mutant has different barcode. And we, after one day, we just hybridize this to the, the barcode chip, and, which will, and, and it will tell the, the, the signal for every, every strain, every type of cell. And then we just use the wild type of the normalization we, we, we use the mutant number of cells divided by one time mutant cell. That gives the fitness number. Okay. Right. So the wild type, of course, wild type divided by wild type is always gives me 1.0. Okay. But this one gave me 0.96, which means if I delete this gene, this is going to grow 4% 4, 4 slower than wild type. Okay. That's what the DNA means. So, so basically, the, the larger that number, uh, the fitness is, it actually means the smaller the contribution of that gene to the fitness, right? Because, here, look at this number. So, you, let's, let's compare this to mutant. There's another mutant after they grow, and the fitness is 0.5. Which one have a stronger effect on fitness? Oh, okay. It's actually this gene. Yeah. Because after we remove the, the second gene, the fitness drop drop by half. Right. So this this mutant, the second mutant have fifty percent effect on the fitness. If you remove it, it the cell going to be half as happy as it used before. If we <laughs> if we say right. But the but the first deletion <coughs> mutant when, when we remove it. The cell is only four percent less happy. See, so that's what it. Yeah. So, so this, all those interpretation doesn't affect how you analyze data, but it affects how you interpret the result. Right. So if, if how do you interpret the result is based on the biological uh, how the experiment is done. It's not just simply by the number. Okay, so now here is actually a very interesting thing. If you look at this number, it's actually 1.03. How can that be? That means if some, for, some, for this gene, when I delete it, I compare well, well, I, this thing is 1.03. That means one time. Uh, that means originally this is a, this gene must perform a function of growth inhibition. Oh. So so in actual wild in really wild natural environment, if the cell continue to grow at a fast speed, probably it's not a very good thing. That's actually uh, uh, we measure everything in the laboratory in a rich media, but. In actually doing evolution in a really wild, well, to, to constantly run at a high speed is probably not a very good thing. That's the reason why, uh, I mean, if you drive on the highway, I mean, I'm sure your car can drive like 150 miles. You don't actually drive that fast. <laughs> right? Even though no, you can drive that fast. So, so that's the reason. So, yeah. so that G probably the brake. So if you remove that brake, the, the, it's going to speed very fast. But there's the reason why there's a brake on your car. So. Okay, so, so now we have all three data loaded into R. And in fact, when uh, doing when you write your final project report, you should discuss what does the meaning, uh, what, how the data are measured, what's the meaning of this data, and why that. That's 
And I suggest you taking notes now. That it actually will save your time later on, yes. especially when you write and when uh, doing computational experiment is just like doing wet bench experiment. You should take notes. In this case, you should take electronic notes because you can go back and check it. And when you write your final project report, you don't start from zero, and you already have your notes there, have some results there, and with your, say, your own interpretation and discussion, right? right. So that's how you can work more effectively. Okay, so, and I also converted the, the fitness ORF into the characters, as dot character. So it won't be uh, used as a fake number. Now, and based on the Fraser paper, they actually calculated the number of interaction per gene. So how do we calculate the number of interaction per gene based on the pairwise interaction data? Uh, this is how I did. I'm going to let you really study this few lines of the code and then see whether we can figure this one out. Basically, that's it. Um, so so this, three, this is really a, 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 I have to say I'm really proud of this three lines of code I write. <laughs> it's actually only two lines of code. This we just double check. This two lines of code calculate the number of interactions Gene. In the protein, in a, a protein or gene interaction network, in the entire network. And my question is, explain how it does. How? This two lines of code. And so you, you pay attention. You, you probably want to draw a diagram. What does the first line does? What does the second line does? Yeah, you need a diagram to explain. Uh, oh, I need a diagram to explain. <laughs> yeah. okay. What does a C processes mean? Yes, I'm creating a vector. And what does a pairs dot ORF pairs dot ORF two mean? Why I'm creating a vector based on these two things? What, what I'm trying to do there? What are, what are we trying to do there? Interaction data. Oh, this is terrible. Uh, I have the pairwise interaction data. How do I calculate the number of interactions per gene? Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
What does table do? Calculate the number of interaction per protein or per gene in the network. So you can calculate. That's a great question. But compatibility. Mm, that's not what I'm talking about. But what do you mean? Like what goal would what or what work well with what as far as the the That's fine. Okay. No, that's, um. Well, let's let's first draw what we have right now. So 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 uh, and, and see whether we can work out. Uh, so right now uh, right now uh, so initially we have O R F one O R F two. So I just call it gene one, gene two, gene two, gene three, gene two. And how do I calculate the number of interaction per gene? I have to keep count. How do I, in, in, let's say this is a small network. How do we calculate the how do we how many gene interaction is gene one, gene two, gene three, gene four? Tell me how do we find this one out? This is our small this is our small network. And uh, how many interaction of gene one, two, three, four? Oh. Gene one is two. Gene two is three. Four. 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 Gene three. Wait, do you count twice? Like I, they have like gene one, gene two, then gene one, gene two again, the bottom. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Let, let's say that to gene three. Sorry, that shouldn't be too many. Okay. okay. So, uh, G1 has two. Yeah. How many is G1? Two. two. G2? Three. Three. G3? Two. Two. There's one. One. How did you find this one out? How, how did you find out this is two, this is three, this two, this one? How did we find out, basically? How many, how many times that occurred, like, as far as the interactions, how many times one interacted with every gene? Okay. So, so how many times we count? One, two, and then we say this is two. Okay. Then, how do we know this is three? We count two, two, and that's why it's three, the black. I need more colors. So this is what the table does. The yes, table should does. But how do we run table on these two colors? Uh, three here, three, three, and these two. And three. And the four, another color blue. Four is this one. How, how do you run table on this? How do you use table to complete this? <coughs> basically, how many? Basically, you just count how many times each gene occur in this pair, right? One, one, gene one, gene one, and twice. In two, in two, in two, three times, right? You just count how many times it occurs in this. But how do we use round table? How, how do we use the R table command? Found this. Right, how do we complete this counting process? But if you if you run table say 
ORF1, it will just count this column. Right? If you count table ORF2, it just count this column. How do we count in all of them? Really? Can you not try, try not? Uh, I'm actually curious whether that will work or not. <laughs> that, that's totally creative. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> uh, it should work. Actually, it should work. If you create something, then sum it up. That also should work. Uh, it's it's good. Right? If you if you do a table on this one, a table on that one, if you can add them up, that certainly is the occurrence of the two table, two columns. Right? If you can do that. Yeah, but you need to figure out a way to. Do. That's not an easy. It's not a. That's not a straightforward method. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If you can add them up, that would be yeah. You should give mathematically will give you the same answer. Yeah. If I use them to add up, I get an A plus. Sorry, what? If I use them to add up, I get an A plus. I'll give you a bonus point. I'll give you say. Two. What? That's too much. <laughs> I give you five bonus points on like that. That's really a lot. Right, I mean, if you have a B, by, uh, B plus, now you're going to switch you to an A, five points, right? Oh, you want to see your final grade. Right, right, yeah. how about that? If you figure that one out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, since I'm recording, so I'm not going to eat my award, say five points. <laughs> so, yeah. But, I didn't, I didn't use, that's certainly a different approach. I didn't use that approach. I want to use this directly to get the final result. And how did I do that? So, so I have two columns here. I basically put them into a one column. I, I concatenate them, put them all together, and then run the table. So that's when I get one result directly. That's basically what I'm trying to do. Okay, but but the one I suggest that if you cut both of them, cut two of them separately, you can add them up. But when you add them, you have to make sure each gene add up to itself, not to others. Right. So that's kind of a tricky uh, addition. You don't want to add gene two, three, not to gene one. So when you add it, you have to make sure they are in exactly the same order. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, so we we not only uh, discussed my own way to address this problem, we even come out of a different way to address it. Yeah. So certainly you have a think through. Oh my gosh, my friend says overload. Who just reviews the recipe? Is it too soon to ask what the project is like? What? Is it too soon to ask what the project is like? No, no, no. After we finish, the pro this is basically what we're going to do with natural analysis. Did you do the same thing? Similar thing. Similar? Genomic analysis. Something you either call it a statistic genomics or uh, beta mining of genome beta, beta so, mining. yeah, or whatever, bioinformatic analysis. So. We can go like work for Google or something. What? We can go like work for Google after we do all this stuff. Because I think it's like a lot of beta mining. I think Google probably use similar methods. Yeah. Which is just general. You can work for, say, Merck or Kai Junos. Biotech America something. Merck had a very nice biotech group. Yes. Many of my, uh, well, not many, several of my classmates work at Merck. Yeah. Oh. And they pay almost twice. <laughs> Sorry, I said <should> cut oh. <laughs> But I work. I got to work at Spelman. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so let's see. Let's just run these two code and see what we have. Okay. Now, after, so 
why I'm running so if you look at the I uh, degree now on the on the panel side this is where the degree, uh, degree is now here yeah it basically say one three four all these numbers uh, in fact it's probably much easier if I oh this is really taking a lot of memory uh, I'm going to just look at the first few lines see it's basically this if you look at the first few lines of degree it's basically say counting every gene say this gene occurred only once this gene occurred only 3, 3, 2, 7, 24 times so this, this gene has 20, occurred 24 times in that pairwise interaction list which means it's interacting with 24 other proteins and the first gene occurred only once means it's only interact once with a different protein and it basically just goes through all the proteins that we have yes, in fact it goes through how do we know uh, how do we know how many are there we use the structure degree there, there are there are 4478 genes in our network right now 4478 in fact that's closer to the biological limit where there are 5500 5, each gene but about a thousand of them are essential so it means when we delete that gene the yeast is bad and only about 4500 genes are non-essential genes which means when we delete we can still grow them so 447A is pretty, very close to the biological limit we can do for yeast yeah. so we basically cover the entire yeast gene of all this Human, how many genes do you have? Yeah, that's 22 to 25 times. It's 20,000, a little bit over 20,000. Yeah. That's a good number. So it would be 5 times more. Yeah. Okay. So could you do Because people use R to analyze human gene all the time. Okay. Yeah, so if you are interested, you, can, you don't want to work on easy, you can do human. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> there are human data there. There are human data there. In fact, they already loaded into R. Yeah. In bioconductor, there is a separate uh, whole consortium called bioconductor. Yeah, well, in fact, uh, uh, we, we are going to use bioconductor and analyze real data. And if you are really into how yeast relate to human, you can compare with the human. It's not hard. It's, I, I think. Can you use R to compare the human data too? We learn to use R and it's much easier to use R for doing that. Like a blast search, you can say? Blast search is for sequence comparison. Right? That's how we're comparing now, we're not comparing We're not comparing sequences. There are, there are people have already done the, those processes. Blast has been invented almost 20 years ago. People yeah. has done that. So, so we can just, so in R we can just load the existing data and do the high level analysis. Okay. High level analysis. So Blast is really a low level analysis. Mm -hmm. okay. I should have called low level. It's kind of first step analysis. Yeah. R is more like a high level yeah, analysis. And the way I'm, I'm, I'm summing up, sum up her entire degree is just to double check whether I did it correct or not. So, so if I look at the, the basically what I'm, the, the total number of the degree should be the length of ID, right? So the length of ID is, if I type this, these two numbers should be exactly the same. Yeah, in fact they are. Yeah. So that's just to double check. 
So when, when we are doing computational analysis of in fact doing anything, you always want to make sure things are working in the right direction or are working properly. So always double check. It, like uh, I'm not sure whether it's a good idea, <laughs> a good example or not. Like if you are going on a trip and you want to make sure you are in the right direction, you don't in some of the movie, you see people are driving and not paying attention, take a different route and go through. <laughs> yeah. You, you want to make sure, I mean, always on the right <laughs> This That's what I'm trying to do. I, I calculate the number of interactions. How do I know I did actually the result even making sense? I calculate the entire, add up everything up and see whether it actually is the number. The, the, the entire number of interactions I have. And I double check them, it, these two are the same. So, okay, it's like, at least it's making sense. So, okay, uh, but I want to, now the, the whole thing is to, uh, we, so right now we have the number of interaction, we have the evolutionary distance. We want to repeat figure one for the science paper. And what are missing here? Now we, we want to, okay, so basically here, well, yeah, we, we want to re regenerate Figure one in Fisher paper. Now uh, we have a degree and K evolution and distance. I know where the code do we In data. Right. No, we, we call it data here. Right, the first one we loaded the uh, there we call it data. Okay. That's that's the evolution distance. Oh, those are yeah, okay. and then we calculate the, the degree. Uh, yeah, so we have the degree. We just calculated here, and then we have the evolution distance in data, which is ka and ka. So basically, we want to do a linear regression between that, and we want to we want to run linear regression function ln. Between degree and K A. How can we do that now? Can we do it now? Uh, if you try, if you try here, if you try, if we try linear regression degree versus uh, how do we? What's that? Uh, that should be data dot. Uh, Ka, but this won't work. So what's missing here? We have the we have the data there. We just cut our we have the number of uh, interaction per gene. We also have the evolution distance on that. And if you look at the figure one on that science paper, it basically run a linear regression between the k and the number of interactions. So so we have we have this as k a. We just have this one in. A different file, we have this in something we call data. We have this one we call degree. 
when we want to generate this linear regression, why we can do it? What? What kind of format are we looking for? But I feel like because degree, like that's like a group of values that we generate, but it's not actually like a table of how like how the what we're looking for. Yes, I, uh, you are not gonna do that. Yeah, the data whatever is an actual like columns and like a group of data with degree. That was just like a group of values. It was not actually uh, data. It's not actually putting data. It's just not in the data form we, we like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how? Okay. First, how do we run the? If you think about how do we run the linear regression function in R? Basically, we have to put everything in the same spreadsheet to run the linear regression function. Right. And right now, we have this in degree, this one in data. They are separate. So R cannot match the degree with K. It doesn't know which way in which. Right. So when we put everything together in the same spreadsheet, we basically should, we, we, this is something we, should, we are looking for. We are looking for something, say, KA. And then degree, and then we ORF. This will be gene one k probably point o point two. Say so degree is three. Gene two. This will point three, and degree is uh, one. We're basically looking for something like this. With ORF names like this, KA data here. And with degree also there, and matching by rows. We basically have to merge these two data sets into one spreadsheet, and every value should be matched by rows, which is gene names or OIF names. That's what we want to do. Before we can do that, we cannot run the linear regression function. That's basically what we are trying to do. Okay, and let's see how we are going to do this. Okay, and philosophically, how are we going to merge these two things together? Before we, we, we go into the actual R code, strategically speaking, how are we going to do this? We have these two data sets, how are we going to merge them? Uh, by what? By based on what criteria merge them? Well, okay, so so let let's use another example. And I mean, the, the President Obama want to push for some nationalized uh, health care. Right now, uh, ma many of the insurance are offered by state. Let's say. I could live live in both Tennessee and Georgia. If these two healthcare system, insurance systems merge together, how are they going to fund my insurance record in the two states that merge them? Okay, so they have to find something in common. So here, how do we merge these two interaction and the evolution rate together? Based on yeah, based on gene name, the, all the open reading frame, the systematic name. Gene name sometimes can be uh, redundant, or because people name their gene based on what they know, they, they can't choose different names. Uh, right? Also, people can have same name. Right? But social security number is supposed to be unique. 
Like an open reading frame is decided based on the systematic way, chromosome location, left and right, which strain. So that's actually is a unique. Yeah. So we basically have to merge all the data based on the open reading frame. Yeah. So that's what we are going to do. So now before we do that, we actually put the gene length uh, degree first into a data frame. Data frame is uh, basically the uh, spreadsheet in R. In Excel, it's called spreadsheet. In, in R, it's called data frame. So this is the, so we put degree into a data frame. In this, this time, I call it the net, basically short for network. And you can, if we run these two there, uh, now it shows, if I, if I do head net, now it actually shows frequency and IDs. Now the problem is ID is still a fake number, so I then I run as dot character convert the IDs also into the characters. And I run that now. ID yeah. ID is ID frequency. Yeah. Oh, I, I think I have a typo here. I should net.ids. Uh, let me not change it. Uh, I should change it. Otherwise, uh, oh, OK. Let me still keep a word, what it is. So this way, uh, we don't make mistake, I guess. So this time, if I look at the net again, so see, now we have a the old one, which is a plural ID, that's still a fake number, but the new ID is now uh, a letter. And then I basically remove the first column because the first one is fake number, I don't want to use it. So I remove the first one, first column, so I just to make things become simple. So minus one means to remove the first column. You don't want to run this twice, otherwise you will remove the extra, remove the extra column. So so now we have interaction degree in that and evolutionary rating data to spreadsheet. We need to uh, we need to merge the two data frame. Uh, Spread sheet based on ORFs. Basically, like social security number. Or genes. Okay, to merge it, this is actually the key why we don't want to use a fake number. Because fake number can assign different same number to different names. But if we use always the name of the letters, that actually will always be exactly the way we want to merge them. So if we if we don't converge the the fake data fake number into uh, characters, we will have mistake here. That's that's the reason why we want to treat the gene name as a letter, not as a fake number. Okay. So this. So if we want to merge them based on the social security number for gene, which is ORF here. So first, we want to see if indeed the, 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 this number can match or not. So that's, that's what the intersect command does. So now, if, before, before we can do this, you can also run uh, structure net. Uh, structure data just to see whether we can match them or not. So the data is the in in NET net the upper the gene name is is called is in a column called ID. But uh, 
in the spreadsheet called data, the OIS name is called, the OIS column is actually called OIS name. It's is unfortunate, but because data comes from heterogeneous sources, so very often uh, each column are named different, including cases, even even the way it's called. That's actually is it's probably the most practical challenge in doing a, a informatics work called data analysis because the, you collect data in Tennessee, you collect data in Georgia, they're probably going to call same things differently and even in different formats. That's actually the, the most practical challenge is how to convert heterogeneous data into the same form. And so <laughs> it's kind of a, there's really not much fun in that, but it's, it's uh, that's what the basically a practical challenge to do. Yeah. So in our case, and we want to see whether the, the two uh, gene IDs actually match or not, and we run intersect for that. It seems to be good. And we want intersect for that. And, whoops. Uh, so here, uh, I have, I have uh, 3,300 genes with evolutionary data. I have 4,400 genes with protein interaction data. When I match the two, I now have uh, how much? I have 26, 76 genes are matched. So I, we have 26, 76 matching ID, matching OIS. Uh, So I'm going to so uh, so bonus point will be given to find out find out why some OIF are not matching. So in, in this case, uh, but right now I'm going to ignore it here. There are why some of the OIF are not matching. Uh, I'm ignoring it here. But if you find it out. I will also give you a bonus point. So. Okay, so so this won't work. And we, how do we merge these two data set in R? And there is a function called match. Uh, this is a this is probably one of the most useful. Uh, function in R for bioinformatics analysis or for beta mining analysis. This function called match, and this is function. This function is also one of the my favorite function of R. And if you if you look at the match function, you look for the help menu of match, and it actually tells you exactly what this match function does. So it says match returns a vector of the position of the first matches of its first argument in its second. This is, okay, I, I see many of you seem to be already, <laughs> already start to face me up. Uh, but this actually, this match function is the key. Uh, it's going to, if you if you know how to do it, it's going to be very useful. So in fact, if you look at the Moodle site, let me see whether I already have a match. Uh, oh well, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, let me see whether I have a match uh, YouTube video for you to look at. Uh, match. Okay, I'm going to post my YouTube video on this. So, actually generate a YouTube video to explain what the match function does. And how about you watch it now and... Uh, What? I just, I just say we have like a 
Let me post it on the Moodle. Oh, we should actually share that on Java because it's, right now the everything is so large now, it's much easier to do it on Java now. Uh, so okay, so I'm going to ask, ask you to re, uh, look at the YouTube video on the match function and then, uh, and then uh, let me post it now. So, Let's re I guess it's uh, time for review now. Uh, <laughs> uh, How to use match function? Yeah. So Yeah, so I put the YouTube there, and then let me also find the genetic interaction data if you want to analyze that one.
Yeah, it's, uh, it's here. Uh, let me put the last CD data. So I'm going to put this on Java. So how many of you already have Java account? <laughs> okay, Taylor. Yeah. Okay, let's set up a Dropbox account. Okay, uh, Asha, can you help Kayla set up a Dropbox account? So, okay, here's my. Uh, So I'm going to create a, a folder called uh, bio 386 data. Okay. And then, uh, but you you shouldn't put your own, you shouldn't put a, make modification to that folder because that's all, all the data we are sharing. So if we modify it, that can be a problem. <laughs> so you should copy paste the, everything into your own Dropbox folder, then work on it. So I'm going to create a new shared folder. I'm going to have bio386. Uh, I'm going to share with uh, everyone of you. So let's start with uh, Okay, J code. I, I see a J code four seventy eight at hotmail dot com. Okay, uh, Tanisha. What's your account? How about you come here, Tati? Yeah. My own Dropbox account. Yeah. Okay, Ayla. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Oh, you can sign my name. It should come up. It should come up. Ella, ever? No, it's not coming up. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I forgot. Ella, it has so many. I'm sorry. Oh. Just share it right now, uh, and then I'm going to uh, share more. Uh, so, Jasmine, how about you come here type your job? Okay. 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 And uh, because uh, you should, with, oh no, it's probably not there. Right? Uh, if you, is that it? That's me. Okay, that's me, that's me. Okay, let me attention. Asha. Email? Yeah, your Dropbox email. Yeah, send the invitation. Okay, so now you should log into a Dropbox and accept the invitation to join this program.
not a different thing. Uh, you should, so once you log into a uh, job box, uh, you should be able to see something uh, uh, in my patient notice or something. No. Let me see. Uh, yeah, just accept that. Uh, okay. And then I'm going to put the, the put my data. I'm going to put the instruction data in that folder. Copy. Uh, it's 128 meg, that data. It's actually quite large. Okay, so yeah, I see uh, Asha, Tanisha, Jasmine, Jessica are already connected uh, there. So, um, yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, the internet is slow. Uh, we... Oh, sorry, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I lost. <laughs> should also create a Dropbox folder I shared with me. So you probably create a Dropbox folder something like this. Uh, <coughs> your last name, and then say uh, 386 or bio 386. You should create a Dropbox folder like this and then share it with me. And my Dropbox uh, email is Q-I-N-S-P-A-T at gmail. Okay. Uh, <coughs> you should put your uh, project data, copy paste that way into a project data and uh, do, the, do the analysis there. And then that way, um, if you have mistake, if you need help, uh, I can help you with the code, I just go directly into that folder of yours and look at the R code and computing results and then how you what change or what directions we need to go there. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. So how do we find that folder? You first uh, 
you, you need to remember where you install the Java. So for example, on my computer, I have an entire folder called Dropbox, and everything on my Dropbox is there. And I also created something called shared Dropbox. So that you don't want to share everything with other people. I mean, I so so in my case, I put I put every shared folder in a folder I call shared, and that one I also uh, yeah for student I actually call student the shared folder. There I so. And I also have various students working with me right now, so their shared folder is also there. So basically, you want to. It's basically it's the uh, network flash drive. You basically, everywhere you go, you assign have network can uh, use it almost like a virtual flash drive. So. <coughs> You can just go to, um, how do we create a folder or share? You go to a Dropbox web account, say new shared folder, you create that one with the last name by 386, and then after you create it, you see an option on the right, and you click option, say, then you say invite people, put my email address, chinstat at gmail.com, and then click send invite. That should uh, work. Uh, Oh, don't create a folder inside of that one. Yeah. Oh, I my hold on what? Yeah. Uh, well, no, I don't think I did that. I think yeah, don't because I don't unless you want to share it with everyone else. Uh, it doesn't matter. If you if you don't mind probably it's also a good idea to you. Because uh, some of you probably going to work with other classmates on the project. Right? So um. So I made a folder, so I have to just hit like share. Yeah, it's it on the if you in the sharing on the on the left side. Oh, okay, someone is okay. See, uh, one new shared folder invitation. I click, and that seemed to be just just Jasmine. Okay, and I click accept. Very good. Yeah. So. You did it too? Yeah, so right now, Jasmine, there's nothing there. I mean, <laughs> uh, that's a good start. <laughs> so one, two, three, four, five, six. Yay, so everyone can see the data right now. Yeah. Uh, Ella, Jasmine, Asha, Kayla, Tanisha, Jessica. Yay! Everyone is connected on Java. Okay, so you should uh, use the genetic data now. Oh, okay. I shared the folder with mm -hmm. you. Ah, okay, I see. <coughs> So I probably need to refresh my screen to see the yes uh, two new shared folder invitation from Ella Harley and uh, McCoy Genome. Oh, yeah, uh, you want to remove the if there's a, a white space in your name, remove that white space. That will really be, that will be really confusing later. How do I, um, uh, you probably can rename it on job box. So let me see. Uh, try not to remain any of the photo with white space. That will make your programming work much more troublesome than it actually. Yeah, it's running 
Okay, see, so I now have a, a directory from Anna, from Kyla, from Jasmine, and you, and Tanisha, and uh, Asha. Oh, Asha. Ah, see, I see Jessica. Uh, Okay, I see Tanisha's. And then I see Jessica's. Ah, uh, you, should, you should name your folder with your last name, otherwise it's going to look... Uh, Jessica, you should name it the folder with your last name. Okay. Uh, otherwise it's very confusing for me to read it. Also. Oh, I, uh, go back. Uh, no. Uh, oh, if you install it here, you have to always use this computer. Otherwise, you have to install it again. Oh, no. I haven't installed my computer, so I don't Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, because the job is installed here. So, you have to go to the folder. Finder, right. And then, open the finder, new window. Yeah, I didn't install that. Oh, you didn't install. Oh, really okay. Then how do you rename? Do we have to wait till we get back on our system? No, no, no. You can. You should also be re rename. I, I just don't know how to rename on Dropbox. Uh, hold on, let me see. Is that option? No. That's option. Yeah, that's option. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Thank you. 
This is something to cut naturally. I, I expect something to cut naturally. Uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs>